from the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Danda, and I have my awesome co-host here today as well, Vera Mehet, who will be joining me in this conversation. And we have an awesome guest today. So this is someone who's worked for big brands such as McLaren, NatWest. He's a passionate engineer and someone who is particularly focused on bringing technical and people skills together. And I can't wait for this conversation because we just don't know where it's going to lead to. And I'm also particularly interested in his passion for dogs. My kids have been asking for a dog for ages, so I'm hoping to learn a few things from him today. So Darren Yeats, welcome to the show today. Hey, Paddy. Hi, Vera. Good to meet you. I don't know if you know, but I'd actually heard a lot about you for a long time. I never got to speak to you before, so I, I don't know if you knew Is that. that. A good thing? Is that a good thing? Is it at all? I got to learn a lot from you, from the people you'd gone on to teach in your initial kind of like training ground or where you'd helped teams get into better ways of working. Brilliant. Yeah. I never realised that. Thank you for telling me. So I want to kind of tell the surprise early that this conversation isn't just to find out Darren's superpowers, but we also want to find out about your super dog, Millie. So I'm just itching to know, how is Millie doing today? She's asleep on the bed upstairs today, but she did come down the beach with me earlier. Whenever we get a storm like this, I take her down and I do a flapometer reading. So so she's an English Springer Spaniel with uh, with the big flappy ears. So if you position her just right, the wind kind of flaps the ears. So depending on the the speed of the wind, we get a different flapometer reading. So we were pretty much a nine or a 10 today. Amazing. Well, I'll try not to be too loud then. We don't wake her up. So you put your search dog activities you get up to, you've got your work stuff going on and, Mm -hmm. you know, you'd spend time helping gay communities. You've joined our podcast. I know you're a speaker. You do lots of different things. So firstly... I was wondering, could we find out, have you always been interested to do like a variety of things and try new things out? I've never been one to do normal things. So uh, I guess if, if I look at my brother and my sister, you know, it sounds, makes them sound bad now, but yeah, my brother's like, likes to play football, which is great. My sister likes to play golf, which is great. I kind of dabble with those when I was younger, but in the end, I decided to do paragliding and then hang gliding and then kind of other different different kind of sports and and so forth. So I've never been someone to kind of toe the line, so to speak. And and I guess that's reflected in my career. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really keen on making sure that we should all have jobs that we enjoy. And that includes myself. So, you know, if I'm not being challenged or if I'm not enjoying a role, I will find one that I will enjoy. And, you know, I've, I've moved on a few times and all the jobs that I've had, I can, you know, hand on heart say that I've really, really enjoyed for the time that I've, I've done them and I've learned a huge amount. So, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, pulling all that together, whether it's work or whether it's my volunteering with search and rescue, it's, it's really just about, you know, continuous learning, having fun, meeting people. Yeah. I, I'd probably sum it up as that. Yeah, nice. Thank you, Darren. And also something I've noticed is that you don't separate all those different things into different compartments of your life. You kind of take learnings from other places and combine them. It took me a while sometimes to make those links though, right? So, you know, from from a work perspective, I've been, I'll give you an example. I've been kind of doing agile ways of working and whatever you want to call it outcome driven ways of working for for quite a while since roughly 2006 now and i've been doing my search and rescue activities since 2014 but it wasn't probably until i don't know 2018 2019 when i i, I it suddenly occurred to me that actually the the things that i do in both of them are very similar different contexts but the way that we work in a search and rescue team for example is quite similar to how a scrum team works and and vice versa and 
I, I put together a little talk that I, I kind of did around the, around the kind of various uh, conferences in 2020, I think it was, or 2019. And that was principally around how search and rescue uses agile and scrum techniques to help find missing people. The, the example I gave there was, you know, showing how in 1989, there was a search with, no, seven, sorry, there was a search with 6,000 people who spent eight days searching for a nine-year-old boy. Um, and they didn't get any result. They didn't find the boy until the ninth day. How does that compare to a search, for example, that we did in 2019 with 15 searchers who are able to locate that missing person within eight hours? What What's different? How did that happen, right? What have we learned in that 30 years to enable us to be that much more efficient? So, you know, I looked into that search. I made a little presentation around that. And it was, it was really, really interesting because Funnily enough, uh, if you look at the main reasons why that search in 1987 didn't work, these might sound familiar, right? I, I try and remember them all, but it was uh, siloed dysfunctional teams, people not collaborating, not having the big picture across all the teams, a hero searches out for glory, and you know, effectively people not working together for a common goal, for a common outcome, which is to find that missing person. So, you know, that's unfortunately quite often seen in, in many of our organizations and businesses. So, you know, the, the things that, that we did in search and rescue between 1987 and 2019 were very similar to the things we do across our de delivery and development teams over the last 10, 15 years, you know, so rather than yeah, focus on focus on outcomes, uh, priority based planning, using empirical estimates to, to estimate things are going to get done using the right people in the right role, I could go on, et cetera. Right. But, but all, all of these things that, you know, you, if, if, if you speak to any agile coach that, well, I can see Paddy nodding as I'm saying them now. Right. So, so, so the, the, these are all the things that you would go and speak to the delivery or development teams for. And yet we're using the same thing in, in SAR, you know, when I go out, when I get a call out or my phone goes beep beep and I have to go out with Millie to find that missing person, we go out in very small, very skilled teams and we're trusted to get the job done. We're not told how to go out and search. We just said, could you go and search this area, please? Great. We're going to do that. Right. So it's, 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 you know, we're given an outcome and we go and use the skills that we have to go and deliver on that outcome, you know, rather than being micromanaged and, and so forth. So, so yeah, so there's a, there's a massive link that I kind of triggered. And, and once I did that, that first link, I kind of, my mind raced a little bit and I, I created other talks one you know, around how you can break down work into smaller chunks based upon the Martian film. One, one was about a United Airlines flight 283, I think, that's crashed because of various reasons and, and how the, it, 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 even though it was, uh, unfortunately a little bit of a disaster because quite a few people died, you would expect given the circumstances to everyone to die on that aircraft. And th they only managed to save as many people as they did because of the collaborative nature of the team working on the actual aircraft during the incident. So there's all, there's all things like that, that can come together to, to, to really highlight the fact that things like agile and lean, they're not specific to development or technology or, or business in general, they're just relevant to life and, and how we as humans and people should treat each other. Right. Going along those lines, agile isn't just the tech. I wonder if we could try this so we could be having some listeners who've never heard of Agile or Scrum before, for instance. Could we take what you do with, with Millie in Lowland Rescue and try and use what you do in that context to explain what Agile is? Yeah, right, well, let's, let's try and do that, shall we? So, so I, guess, I guess we'll start with what we're trying to achieve. Because we very rarely do that. We always talk about, oh, we need this. We need to do this work. We need to do that. We always talk about the work. We always talk about the how. We dive straight to the solutionizing, right? And sometimes if you step back and say, but why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's the so what in the thing that we're trying to do here? And, and you'd be amazed how many teams even would turn around and say, well, because we've been told to do it. Mm, okay. That, that's not really an answer, but what is the reason we're doing this? You know, if we could get in a time machine and go forward six months, what would we have then that we don't have now? So, so starting with the outcome and focusing on the outcome rather than focusing on the output, which is what many people do is probably the first step. So that's, that's the first thing. Probably the second thing I'll do is realize that 
we need to do planning, right? There's a lot of misconceptions out there that says, oh, we're agile, right? We just make it up as we go along. We can't tell you when things will get done. And um, it kind of makes me squirm a little bit every time I hear a team say that because it gives it gives Agile a bad name, right? But but yeah, you know, in Agile, you absolutely do planning. You just do planning differently. So you have to appreciate complexity. You have to have an understanding of how you do adaptive planning. And most importantly, you have to understand that plans will change. And you cannot, it doesn't matter how many people you lock in a room or how long you give them, they will not be able to think of, everything that's going to happen over a project. So, you know, take your best guess, make a plan, move on. And then when things change, you change that plan. Right. And, and I think, you know, when people ask for project plans and estimates and stuff like that, people very much get into the context of, well, you've given me an estimate of four days, but an estimate's still a guess. Right. So, you know, we, we have to, we have to understand that. And, and when we're doing searching, the, the search planners will go and ask us to search a particular area. It's a guess. It's, it's where we're estimating where that person is. By the way, we do it around empirical data, just in search and rescue, just as we do in, in technology or, or DevOps or, or, or delivery. So, so we have in search and rescue a, a fairly large database of search, uh, search statistics. So we can say, right, okay, for our missing person or miss birds, a 44 year old male with uh, mental illness, with a history of, uh, a history of attempted to su- taking their own life, attempted suicide. And we can kind of plug that in, all that data in, and uh, we'll get this kind of plan presented to us and say, well, okay, given the information you've given us, we think this person could be within 1.2 kilometers of the place last seen. We think that person will probably be hiding within a structure or a boundary of a structure. We think this person and so on and so on and so on. So you can use all that to plan the search better. So it's, yeah, people have a misconception that search and rescue is basically just, you just, we just get lots of people and just send them out randomly. That's not how we work. That's how we worked in 1987. That's not how we work in 2019. In 2019, we work on stats, we work on empirical evidence and we work on scenarios. So we say, okay, this guy could have come out of his house. He went to the end of this path and he could have turned right. He could have turned left, but let's assume he turned right because he was going to the shops to buy a pint of milk and he got lost along the way, for example. And then from that, using maps and the data, we can say, okay, well, this is a high likelihood area. This is a high likelihood area. And we can send teams in those areas to go and look for those, for that missing person in that area. It's not a, mis- a needle in the haystack scenario. It can become a needle in the haystack scenario if it goes on, you know, multi-day searches because, you know, you, Unless you get more intelligence, you, you know, you've got to go with what you've got. And at some point you may decide to stop the search. But so that's, that's, that's one thing. Uh, multi-level planning is another one. So we don't just plan at the top and f- feed it down. Planning is happens at all levels. So planning happens at, in the control van. It happens uh, within the team leaders. It happens within the search teams and it happens dynamically continuously throughout the search throughout the, throughout, you know, the, whether it be an, a multi hour, multi day, multi month, whatever we use small multi-skilled teams, you know, teams of seven people, plus or minus a few people, right? That's a really powerful size team to be able to go and deploy and move out. And the reason for that is that it's, that it's easy to collaborate when you've got that number of people. It's easy, the, the communication touch points are, are, are a lot less. If you've got a team of 15, 20, 25 people, I don't know what that person's doing over there. I, one of the tests I do with some of the teams I work with is I go into the team and say, well, hey, Bob, do you know what Sally's doing? And with a team of seven, eight, six people, absolutely down. I know what Sally's doing. She's doing this, 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 and this. If you had a team of, I don't know, even 12, 14, 15 people, if you ask the same question, oh, do you know what? I don't know. I've been so busy. I haven't been able to catch up with everyone, right? So it's, it's really important to have the right size team to give them the information. We shouldn't be information hoarding. I'm a manager, so I need to know this. I don't need to tell the teams, right? Oh man, that's so old hat, right? So, so giving, you know, you need to give your people the information, everything they need to do their job, they need to understand because most of the time, do you know what? They have more information than you actually. And it's probably the other way around that it should happen, right? So the people who are closest to the work are the people who can make the best decisions. I'm really curious to know actually what has been one of the more remarkable search and rescue stories that you've been involved in where you 
had success? It's actually quite a difficult question to answer. Because of the people we tend to look for in Lola and Rescue, we're, are, they're either people who don't know they're lost or don't want to be found. So they're either Alzheimer, dementia patients, or mental health or despondence. So um, the people that we found, more often than not, have perhaps been successful in taking their own life. So it's really hard to say what is the most successful because, you know, when, when your outcome is that it's, it's, it's not so much, but there was one example I can give you thinking about it. It was back in 2015, actually, which is a long time ago now. It was quite close to me. It's it it just North of Worthing, a 72 year old ex paratrooper who'd gone missing from his care home in Worthing. It was 3rd of April. It was 4.30 in the morning. We got the call out. I arrived at the RV, I think just, just before five. The foot team have been out and had a look and, and, and hadn't found him. And they were pro progressing to work outwards from where he was. The police drone team had been out, had their new brand new drone up in the, in the sky, which incidentally went tech after about 10 minutes. So they had to bring it down and the policeman stomped off very unhappy. But, um, but at that time I was supporting one of my colleagues who was, who was dog handler. And we were in the back of the uh, care home, looking at a map, trying to figure out how we were going to uh, navigate to the start of our area where Kane, the dog, which is a border collie, was off searching and Kane suddenly came bounding back and alerted on, on his handler, Steve, which basically is as a dog handler is an indication to say, um, I found someone dad, come and follow me and I'll show you where that person is. So Kane took us back to over a fence down a very steep embankment. And we found this guy who was tied up in a load of brambles. He had a lot of his clothing had been torn off him and he wasn't in a good way. And when we found him, it was, it was a case of, you know, how are you? And he goes, oh yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you very much. I've just had my cup of tea and I'm getting ready for bed. He had no idea he was lost. Okay. Cause of his condition. And you know, we, we, we had to figure out how to bring him back up that hill, given the scenario, given the equipment that we had. And, you know, we communicated back to, to the, the search controllers, you know, the situation in real time. And we managed to get him back up the hill. We handed him over to the paramedics and the paramedics went into the house. They treated him and they, they popped out after about half an hour and they came back up to us and said, Darren, just wanted to say he probably only had another couple of hours before he probably would have passed through exposure. So, so that for me was, was probably one of the most successful finds that we had. And it's very rare, actually, we get finds like that because of the reasons that I said, that I, I spoke about earlier. Wow. I think that really brings it home doesn't it, in terms of the work that you guys do. And I think Vera and I sometimes have a bit of a moan about work and we say, oh, you know, having a bad day or just really challenged with this particular team or these people, but actually our jobs are quite easy. It's not like anyone faces that sort of danger. And if we make a mistake, well, what's the worst that can happen? We might miss a deadline or two. Where the outcome is, is saving someone's life. You can't afford to get it wrong. Right. So, mm. so it's, it's super, super important that you know, that we learn from every single search. You know, we, we have debriefs on majority of our searches, call them retrospectives, if you will. Right. And, and, and we, you know, we talk about, you know, what we did, what we could have done better. How do we, how did we support each other in, in, in scenarios where perhaps we do find scenes that are particularly traumatizing. We, we, we have a trauma and instant management support through the team as well. So, so yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a fantastic team to be part of. And I always joke that my search team are my second family because I probably see more of them than I do of my family because we train every week. Right. So, so yeah. And, and when we say training, it's not just a couple of hours, it's a full day. So last Saturday we were out nine to five training up on the Surrey Sussex border. And pretty much every week we dedicate nearly a day to training, whether it's either a weekend day or a weekend, a, a Friday evening. We're supposed to be training tonight, but we've canceled it because of the, the storm. But Friday evenings, we often train from seven till about midnight as well. I think I'll be getting a few tips from you, Darren, if I ever get a dog, because uh, as I mentioned at the start of the show, my kids have been badgering me for it. Really. It's the best thing we ever, we ever did. It's, and we, we obviously we, we waited until it was the right time. We had a young family and so forth. It wasn't the right time, but when we, when we felt that we could get a dog and we could look after it in the right in the way that it should be looked after, that was what, 20. 13. Yeah. We haven't looked back to it. And so much so that Amelia is nine now. So back in November, we got a new puppy. So we have a 25 week old English spring Spaniel who's called Coda. She's Millie's succession dog. So hopefully she'll, Millie will teach her everything that she knows. Vera, are, you, are you a pet lover at all? I've never asked you that. So I, I do like pets. 
I've never had a proper pet apart from tropical fish. I, I also do like dogs and, you know, I've actually met Millie in person as well when I went to see you speak once, Darren. But I'll have to admit, I'm getting over a fear of dogs. <laughs> Uh, you know, I go and walk so much and whenever I pass a dog, I just be like, I'm not afraid of dogs. I'm not afraid of dogs. And when I'm not afraid, they seem to be fine with me, but then I get scared. Dogs are amazing. They will pick up on things like that, right? So, so um, they are able to sense your emotions and sense how, you know, how you're feeling and all that kind of stuff. So if, if they feel you being nervous or apprehensive, that, that potentially could affect the behavior of the dog as well. It's, it's, it's quite funny. We, we have to be assessed every two years as part of Vernon Rescue. And the hardest thing any dog handler will do is go and do national assessments because, you know, you're, you're, you train for so long, you know, your, you, your partnership with your dog is so strong, but you know, you're, you're effectively going off to be assessed to prove that you can do what you do. And, and because it's so stressful, certain dogs, you know, who are fine every, every other day at training and, and all that kind of, as soon as you get to national assessments and the handlers falling apart, the dog will just stand, literally walk beside, beside you and say, do you know what, I'll, I'll stay, I'll stay near you and look after you. You're, you're, you're a bit stressed, right? And, and the handler's going, what are you doing? Go away, go search, you know, but the dog's going, oh no, no dad, it's okay. I'll stay with you. Don't worry. So it, it, it can be, um, entertaining, frustrating, whatever you want to call it for, for the handlers. But yeah, dogs are super amazing for various reasons. But so uh, the fact that they can, you know, detect that kind of thing is, is absolutely amazing. Dogs are amazing. And what you're going into there, the relationship of, of you with your dog, Millie is really important. And then even more so when you're on rescue missions with load and rescue, how do you support that relationship with them building your relationship with Millie? It's something that's built over a long time. It doesn't come in overnight. It's, it's many, many days, months, years of, of training together. And it, it sounds really kind of stereotypical and perhaps a little bit cheesy, but I think, you know, when you, when you see a working dog handler and their dog work, it is something that looks so easy. But yet it's, if you know it, you, you, it's so hard, right? Because you, yeah, it, 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 from the outside in, it looks easy, right? But, but actually it, it just, it's many, many hours and years of, of effort. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm really lucky. Millie is an amazing dog and, you know, I, I can, I can read her body language and she can read mine. So if I wanted her to go and search a particular area, I don't need to talk to her or wave my hands. I just need to almost just look at where I'd like her to go. Or use my body, you know, square up my shoulders to, to wherever I'd like it to go. And she'd go, ah, don't worry, dad, I got that covered. She'll, and she goes, right. So I think, I think it, it's, it, it's lovely. And people ask me, why do you do it? Right. And, and it's because I like to work Millie, right. When I started the search stuff, I didn't actually start it to find me some people. That's just a kind of nice end end game right so i i did it because i wanted to work millie and i saw how much millie enjoyed to do it doing it and i saw how much you know uh, how much pleasure she got from from doing it you know it's it's her thing you know so you know she's upstairs on the bed right but if my call out text goes off or 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 i actually get you know what just in front of this call Right. 10 minutes before I thought I'll go and put my, my search jumper on with my, with my logo on and stuff like that. Right. So I, I keep it all in the drawer underneath the bed. Millie knows that drawer, right? She knows that when I go and get something out of that drawer, it's like, oh, we got a call out. Right. So, so, so right, she came trusting over, looking at me as if say, are we going, are we going out? Yeah. It's like, oh no, Millie, we're not going out. Just get on my jumper. Right. right. So, but she knows the text tone. She knows the, all the signals that, that, that I do or give off. She'll know that what well, we've got a call out. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. You know, like we're off, Dad. Let's go. Oh, that, that's amazing to have that sort of relationship. I wish my kids were a bit like that. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Daddy, you can't say that. 